So we're going to have about a 20-minute presentation by Peter Weiskel from the U.S. Geological Survey. He's going to talk about rethinking the hydrological cycle to incorporate blue, green, and gray water. And then a 45-minute presentation uh, by Arjun Hoekstra. Uh, and he's come six time zones from Twente uh, University in the Netherlands. So we're going to give him a 45-minute uh, presentation here this morning and fill, fit, finish up with just a few minutes of uh, question and answer. Uh, so we'll start right in uh, with Peter. Uh, Peter Weiskel is from the U.S. Geological Survey New England Water Science Center in Northboro, Massachusetts. Uh, Dr. Weiskel has been a hydrologist with the U.S. Geological Survey since 1992. He presently serves as chief of the Massachusetts Rhode Island Office of the USGS uh, New England Water Science Center, trained in geology and hydrology. His recent research addresses uh, indicators of water availability, water use, and human interaction with the hydrologic landscapes across space and time. He has served over uh, he has served on several advisory committees for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, including the Climate Change Adaptation Advisory Committee and the Sustainable Water Management Initiative. So thank you for being here with us, Peter. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I didn't come six time zones, I came 40 miles. Uh, from Worcester, where our, uh, near Worcester, where our office is. But it's great to be here. And uh, uh, I'm going to speak, uh, uh, as Chris mentioned, uh, about green, blue, and gray water and how they can be uh, leading us toward a new understanding of the water cycle. Uh, and let's see here. OK. Um, First of all, basic questions, uh, as I see them in water resource assessment and management, uh, how much fresh water is available in any given location uh, of interest? Uh, how is it available? In what forms? Uh, and finally, how can that water be managed sustainably? My thesis today is that water is available from two natural systems which are tightly coupled and I'm going to call them the green and blue water systems, um, and one human source. Uh, and that source is gray water broadly defined. And I'll talk about narrow definitions of gray water uh, as well as broad definitions. Um, and secondly, sustainable water management practices, I would argue, are those that are best fitted to the opportunities and constraints of which can be hydroclimatic, ecological or engineering uh, of your particular location of interest. So my topics break down into a section on definitions, what do we mean by green water, blue water, gray water. Finally, uh, a term we've introduced uh, recently called hydroclimatic regimes. Uh, then secondly, sustainable water management, what do we mean by that and, and how does this framework relate to sustainability. And then finally, how all of this can help us from a science standpoint, if you will, uh, rethink uh, the contemporary waters, uh, the water cycle. Uh, first, green water. You, some of you or most of you have probably heard this term introduced. Uh, it's very important to, to note by Malin Falkenmark and Johan Rockström uh, from Sweden. They've really introduced this terminology. Uh, essentially, it has a twofold meaning. Uh, and its first meaning is soil moisture in the unsaturated zone, or what I'm going to refer to as the green reservoir. Uh, it, it turns out that globally there's about 64,000 cubic kilometers of water in the unsaturated zone in that soil moisture uh, reservoir. Um, this little schematic shows the framework in which they were working when they uh, originated these terms. Precipitation is considered to be an undifferentiated inflow term. Uh, ET is a green flux out of the unsaturated zone, and then soil moisture represents a reservoir. In uh, humid parts of the world where runoff is generated, uh, we'll get to this in a minute, this is the beginnings of blue water in the watershed that then um, uh, exits uh, the watershed as surface water and groundwater outflow. Uh, 
the point here that's key is that uh, each of these terms has a storage aspect and a flux aspect. Uh, now, we're modifying that green water terminology in uh, a minor way, really, but it, we're placing it in a broader spatial context. By, by we, I mean myself and co-authors on a, on a paper that is uh, out in uh, hydrology and earth system sciences uh, discussions uh, right now. Basically, what we're doing is saying, let's think about uh, not a watershed, but a hydrologic unit, what we call in the USGS a huck. Uh, and not a headwater huck necessarily, though that is a, a type of huck, one that can receive blue water uh, from upgradient and uh, also uh, discharge, if you will, blue water downgradient. In effect, uh, blue water becomes the horizontal component of the water cycle, uh, and the green water becomes the vertical in this way of looking at uh, the world. Uh, soil moisture remains the green reservoir, and again, uh, the vertical flux is, uh, we would define as green um, in the open system framework. Now, blue water, uh, again, this is terminology from uh, Falkenmark and Rockstrom, um, represents, in terms of storage, saturated storage in the environment, streams, lakes, groundwater, wetlands, glaciers, uh, and snowpack, very importantly, uh, snowpack. Uh, represents globally the blue uh, water reservoir. Surface and groundwater fluxes in and out of a landscape hydrologic unit, as we're defining it, uh, represent uh, blue fluxes. And so that's the green-blue story. Gray water has, in our view, in my view anyway, two definitions. One's a narrow definition and it's simply uh, wastewater that's generated from domestic activities, laundry, dishwashing, bathing, for example, which can be recycled for productive uses. Uh, and given the, the theme of this track, of the USDA track, irrigation among them, um, gray water excludes sewage, or it's water that's reused prior to getting mixed with, with sewage, which is also known as black water. Uh, in the engineering literature. However, there's also a broad definition I would like to propose uh, for gray water, and that's simply water that is in the human water infrastructure, broadly <laughs> defined. That can be water supply infrastructure, wastewater infrastructure, stormwater uh, infrastructure, uh, and uh, essentially, in terms of fluxes in the water cycle, uh, Withdrawals, when we withdraw water out of an aquifer or out of a stream, uh, that water is going into a pipe or it's going into a, a structure, a, a well, and it's getting used and ultimately it is getting discharged to the environment most of the time, either locally, that's to say within the hydrologic unit, or it's exported uh, out of the unit. I would argue that this component is the gray water component of the water cycle. Uh, distinguished from the green, which is precip and evaporation, and from um, natural flow systems. Okay, finally, uh, the, the next term, the last term I want to define here is the term hydroclimatic regime. Uh, it's the particular combination of green and blue inflows and outflows uh, to and from a hydrologic unit that characterizes its baseline pre-development water balance. Uh, ultimately, we have to incorporate the effects of development and of humans, but first we need to understand, I think there's value in understanding the pre-development case. And uh, this regime is a function of two things. The local climate, that's to say that uh, precip and evapotranspiration over that unit, uh, and secondly, the hydrologic position of that hydrologic unit in the landscape. And we have a, a, a pretty precise definition of what we mean by the hydrologic position in terms of the water balance uh, of that unit. It's, it, it's simply the fraction uh, represented by precip divided by uh, water uh, entering the unit from green and blue 
uh, sources. So this varies from zero to one. The hydrolog a hydrologic position of one is a headwater catchment, okay, so because there is no inflow. These are zero, and uh, uh, precip divided by precip, they have the same value, so you end up with one. Now, as you get down toward the mouth of a river system, the mouth of the Mississippi River, that hydrologic unit uh, is going to be totally dominated by the through flow, and it'll be very close to zero. So it varies from one to zero. Okay, and here's a, here's a graphic a representation of the concept. Uh, the regime controls how water is available and its dominant flow path uh, through the landscape unit. So um, what we're all familiar to, in, in terms of thinking about that's sort of iconic in our view of the water cycle, which we'll see in a little bit, is this headwater source regime where precip is converted almost completely into runoff. You know, think about the, uh, the basins at, in the headwaters of the uh, Sierra Nevada or the Rockies. This could be, you know, Lake Dillon, the uh, reservoir for Denver, you know, would be an example. Um, at the polar opposite, or diametrically opposed to headwater source regimes uh, are a, a, a contrasting regime that we refer to as terminal sinks. And actually the Sierras, the east side of the Sierras is a great place to illustrate this because if you follow streams coming down the east side from Mount Whitney on down, eventually you'll end up uh, in a Death Valley or uh, other part of the Great Basin situation where there's very little precipitation, where all the water coming into the unit is coming in laterally as blue flow, either groundwater or surface water, and 100% of it goes out by ET. In other words, you're in a closed basin, and you get tougher towers and all this neat geology around them. Uh, so that's one pair in this, this set of hydrologic regimes. And in this corner, what we have is what I refer to as a headwater no-flow system. And this, as we'll see in a minute, turns out to be very important globally. Uh, all the water inflow, or essentially all of it, is from precip, and almost all of that is lost to ET. And then finally, logically, you have the blue water dominated system, which is not only uh, at the terminus, you know, uh, the Mississippi River at the outlet, if you will, or at the mouth, but uh, most river channel, or not channel, river corridor systems will fall when you do the water budget uh, pretty close to this situation, uh, depending on the scale of your discretization. Uh, let's see. Okay, now the, sep the second topic here is sustainability. I like the definition of Bill Alley and his uh, USGS circular on uh, groundwater sustainability. The development and use of water in a manner that can be maintained for an indefinite time without causing unacceptable environmental, economic, or social consequences. In effect, we know what sustainability is because we know what unsustainability is. We, we can identify, you know, in gross terms, uh, the Aral Sea situation or the Lake Owens in California or other types of situations where we are not being sustainable. And so it's a kind of a negative definition, but I still think it's probably our best. Um, the approach I'd like to suggest today is toward sustainable water management is beginning by defining your water balance or the hydroclimatic regime of the landscape unit uh, of interest. Then secondly, identify the dominant flow path, and I put that in quotes, through that landscape unit and what that really is is the dominant inflow-outflow combination. And then apply practices that tap into that dominant flow path in preference to lesser flow paths. In other words, uh, if you're in a, in a situation where precipitation and evapotranspiration are your dominant fluxes, don't tap in necessarily first uh, and right away to the blue water fluxes. And, okay, now here's, here's an example where things would make sense. In a stream corridor flow-through regime dominated by blue water fluxes, those are typically candidates, if you will, for withdrawals and return flows, H out, H in. In terms of the water balance, uh, you've got big fluxes down here, and the, 
the, the water management challenge is to make sure your H out and H in, your withdrawals and your returns, are uh, essentially not altering the flow, let's consider this to be a stream, not altering the stream flow beyond uh, acceptable limits. And that can be in either direction, by the way, either depleting the stream or surcharging it, either depleting the aquifer or surcharging the aquifer, which actually can have real consequences of those of you who know about soil salinization and water logging know. Um, and a second condition for sustainable uh, blue water use, if you will, is that the human flows together are not so large as they are here that they dominate uh, the blue water flows, even if they're the same. In other words, even if you're putting back in everything that you take out and you're observing uh, the water balance in that sense, you may be overwhelming uh, the system and, and causing a human flow dominated situation. A term that we've coined for this is churned, uh, a churned condition. However, most of the world does not consist of river corridors. Uh, Massachusetts does, actually, because we have 11,740 miles of streams in a, in a state that is uh, about 9,000 square miles in area. So we, you cannot walk for a mile in any direction without tripping into a stream uh, in Massachusetts. But about 47% of the world is defined uh, as dry lands using the UN definitions uh, in terms of the aridity index. And that means dry, subhumid, semi-arid, or arid. Precip is essentially equal to ET with very low runoff and recharge. Uh, and uh, consequently, precipitation to evaporation or evapotranspiration is the dominant flow path in the system. And what our, our kind of blue water use in those systems will have a great tendency to either deplete, surcharge, or churn uh, streams or aquifers in those systems because the, the blue components are quite small. Uh, here's an example that's something of a poster child uh, in the United States for this. It's, as was pointed out in one of the USDA talks, it's not a simple uh, thing that the uh, aquifer is getting depleted everywhere. Well, it's getting depleted in the south, in the southern part of the aquifer, in the Texas panhandle and uh, a little bit of Oklahoma. In the north, you see the shades of blue and, and green here. The, the aquifer is actually being surcharged. That's to say water tables are going up relative to pre-development conditions because of diversion of surface water. But in either case, we're seeing an alteration of, of the natural system. Of course, energy costs to pump groundwater go up substantially, not to mention the actual available water is, is getting uh, depleted and, and in some sense uh, semi-permanently because local recharge is way low compared to the withdrawals. It's much lower. But you, you don't have to be in the semi-arid uh, high plains. You can also be in Massachusetts. Uh, if your uh, withdrawals and return flows are large enough relative to the stream flow. And here in Massachusetts, like I said, we have a lot of streams, but we, the, most of those streams aren't very large. And we have a, a, you know, an urbanized uh, region right here around Boston that is, through its water development practices over the last 75 years, I'd say, is leading to some significant uh, stream flow depletion in shades of brown and, and stream flow surcharging in shades of blue most notably uh, the Blackstone River downstream of Worcester and the Assabet River, uh, which uh, is a north flowing stream right here, a stone's throw from the USGS office. Um, so there's several ways to think about mitigating uh, these impacts um, from a blue water standpoint and, and in the agricultural context, that means being much more efficient about irrigation water use uh, I don't know if many of you heard the talk yesterday about center pivot irrigation in, in Africa. Really quite interesting talk. It turns out that center pivot irrigation is really a lot more efficient, certainly than I realized, and than, um, than other commonly type, used types of irrigation like flood irrigation. Uh, and as is well known probably in this group, drip irrigation is also highly efficient. And that is to say it reduces the amount of water you need to withdraw or 
return and therefore impacts on aquifer storage uh, relative to other methods. However, there's a point to be made. You can't get too efficient with your return flows because soil salinization uh, can result if you're not washing the solutes that you're leaving behind with your irrigation water uh, down lower in the profile. Okay, alternatively, uh, in that part of the world, in the dry land part of the world where precip and ET are the dominant fluxes, green water management uh, really becomes relevant. And that's a twofold proposition. One is to restore, protect uh, soil moisture, the green water reservoir, and secondly, uh, to manage better the green water fluxes. And some of those practices that uh, allow better management of the uh, reservoir, something known as no-till farming or reduced tillage farming. This has been an education for me learning about this. Um, use of cover crops, uh, which add organic matter and add uh, nutrients to the soil and also uh, enhance the water holding capacity. And uh, even uh, there's work going on in, on developing perennial grains, which uh, are much, much more resistant to drought. Uh, this is in its early stages, uh, moving from annual to perennial varieties of wheat, for example, but uh, can be a very, has a lot of uh, promise. Finally, uh, adding organic matter via manure and compost. Um, Here's an example of no-till farming out in Iowa. This is not just a boutique type of farming. We're talking thousands of acres here where, where some portion of the prior year's harvest is left in the field. Uh, and another type of crop, in this case soybeans, is uh, planted with big, large machines known as seed drills that actually drill the, seeding, the seeds uh, through this stubble into the soil. Um, there's a lot of benefits from no-till farming, including the water benefits, uh, but um, I'm focusing in on that. You end up building up the soil, its organic matter, and its, its uh, water holding capacity. And just check out this, this uh, very interesting graph from the USDA. If you look at what's happening with wheat, what happened since 2000 to 2010, uh, around 20% to up almost 40% of U.S. acres uh, in planted in wheat are now no-till. There's, there's been a big change, like a doubling for, for wheat just in that period. And, and also with soybeans, um, less so with corn uh, and other crops. Okay, um, and then of course, green water fluxes, precip and ET, um, need to be better managed uh, and in this literature, you'll see a lot of information with respect to maximizing rainfall uh, infiltration at the field scale, ma minimizing unproductive green water evaporation. You know, evaporation is not supporting plant growth. Um, and finally, uh, rain, rainwater harvesting in, in the USDA tract, there's been uh, some very interesting talks on this as well. I'm not going to dwell on that. Uh, and then finally, briefly, the role of water reuse. Um, treatment and reuse of gray water in the narrow sense uh, mitigates the environmental footprint of water use by reducing both withdrawals and return flows. As you can see from the graphic here, we have to pull less water out of the ground um, because some of the water need or demand is being met by recycled uh, uh, return flow and you also put less return flow in the ground. Now, there's, the implication is some treatment has to be done, depending on the use for the water, uh, the level of treatment will vary. And then finally, very briefly, uh, implications for how we think about the water cycle uh, in, in our contemporary world, which is not only wonderful pristine streams where we love to do research, uh, but cities in arid regions where, you know, this is the stream flow, okay, where, where wastewater be <laughs> constitutes the stream flow or an area subject to drought, um, extreme rainfall variability, et cetera. Um, okay, first of all, the traditional image, if you Google water cycle or hydrologic cycle, either one, and this is the main part of Google, not just Google images, this is what pops up. <laughs> 
this wonderful graphic from the USGS, uh, uh, which is very educational, and I, I'm totally in favor of this graphic, uh, especially for certain regions of the world. And those regions are the humid mountain source regions, which very, very, are very, very important, and in fact, provide the blue water needs for 20% of the world's estimate, uh, population. And they're known, in the, uh, there's people who have coined the term the water towers of the world, the Himalayas vis-a-vis -vis India, China, Pakistan, uh, for the Nile, the East African highlands, the Tigris Euphrates depend on the Turkish highlands, and of course, uh, in Europe, the Alps, and North America, uh, uh, the Rockies, the Sierra Nevada, and the Cascades. You know, large populations are dependent on these systems. The Andes, the arid, um, west coast of South America depends completely on water coming down from the Andes. Uh, however, <laughs> the model has important limitations, and some of these have been pointed out by um, Falker, Mark, and Rockstrom. These terms are really owed to them. Uh, there's a humid bias in, in this view of the water cycle. As we saw before, half of the world consists of dry lands where runoff is either not generated or runoff from upgradient sources is consumed. That's to say, ET is greater than precipitation, actual ET, not just potential. Uh, and then finally, uh, or secondly, there's blue water bias. Water management is equated with management of stream flow and groundwater and management of precip, evapotranspiration, and soil moisture are neglected. I would argue there's also a spatial bi a bias that we see the water cycle is this big, it is a global cycle, don't get me wrong, or, and it's continental, but if we think of it only as a unitary cycle, that obscures, in my view, the large hydrologic diversity uh, within watersheds, within regions. Uh, and then finally, the integral role of humans is not represented. Here's an approach, I think, that could help correct these biases. Uh, first, put at the center of our thinking the hydrologic landscape context of which hydrologic units represent a, a, a sub-unit. Uh, really presented or introduced by Tom Winter, a great USGS uh, hydrologist who's now deceased. Um, uh, and who made many, many contributions in the hydrology of, of wetlands, lakes, uh, the semi-arid high plains. Uh, and I, this concept, I think, is one of his most important ones, that, that we think about hydrologic landscapes. Okay. Secondly, use new data sets on climate, hydrography, and, wa and also water balance models, simple water balance models, like those developed by Dave Wolock of the USGS, to discretize the water cycle into local landscape units, make sure that models are constrained by data, uh, then link the units uh, through or into continental sized networks of tens of thousands to literally millions of individual units. And this is being done, by the way. Uh, we did work at this level, and what's now being done at USGS is at the National Hydrography Data Set. Uh, reach hydrologic unit scale of, of about two million uh, units, and then estimate both the total water balance and the net water balance, that's to say the green plus blue and the net uh, of each unit. And then finally, integrate um, the gray components of the water cycle and develop and map uh, both traditional, we can't leave out the traditional indicators and the new indicators of water availability at the continental scale this is the water balance, if you will, that I would argue is how we ought to think about the landscape water balance. And by the way, there's a lot wrapped into this DSDT term. Everything from dams and what they do to stream flow to impervious cover and you name it, uh, both natural and, and human. Um, and from this statement of the water balance, uh, there are both traditional indicators like runoff that can be uh, defined and new indicators, what we call total water availability, precipitation plus landscape inflow, where landscape inflow is simply a lumped groundwater plus surface water term. Here's what happens when you map local runoff. You get this uh, 
very familiar looking map of water availability, if you will, in the US. Notice how vast areas of the West are this sort of red color of almost zero, uh, and, you know, on up to about three centimeters to six centimeters, very, very low water availability in terms of runoff. Um, but if you think in terms of the total water balance, total inflow to a unit rather than net outflow from a unit, you get a map looking like this, which conveys both the blue component of the water balance or the networked component, all of these stream reaches, and the green component, which is the areas in between the stream reaches. Uh, in effect, those represent the amount of precipitation falling in those areas. And uh, Ken Bellitz took one look at this. He's a colleague of mine at USGS and said, that's a good map because Death Valley shows up in it. So there's Death Valley. Um, in any event, this is a combined two-fold approach to water availability, both green and blue. Okay, a, a two-slide summary. Green water, unsaturated water, uh, uh, soil moisture, and also precipitation and evapotranspiration. Uh, blue water, saturated storage, groundwater surface water and surface water uh, and groundwater fluxes. Gray water, narrowly, non-sewage wastewater, and broadly water in human water infrastructure, either in storage or in transit. Uh, the combination of green and blue inflows and outflows is what we call the hydroclimatic regime. It defines the baseline, baseline hydrology of a, of a location. Sustainable water management uh, are practices that tap into the dominant flux in a particular location. And all of this results, I think, and I would say our group doing this work thinks, uh, uh, constitutes a rethinking of the water cycle. In a way, uh, Rich Vogel's concept of hydromorphology really uh, is one way of expressing this as well. Uh, but what we end up with is a water cycle that is discretized, networked, variable in time and space. Some of those variations are long-term trends up and down, you know, the water cycle is naturally trendy. Uh, also integrated with humans, we've done this partially but not fully uh, with our work, done it in the blue water sense, and that, in, and that interaction is both direct, you know, we, are, we constitute fluxes in the water cycle, and indirect, basically everything else we do from climate change to land use change um, to uh, various types of urbanization, et cetera. And that is my talk. So I want to thank a lot of people, uh, especially Malin Falkenmark and Johan Rockström. Also Charlie Vorschmarty, uh, these folks and many others around the world, but I think of these uh, primarily kind of got going a, a science of global hydrology, very much in a management context, I might add. Um, Rich, I just want to thank for all kinds of reasons. And then my... Uh, <laughs> USGS uh, colleagues, some of whom are in this room, uh, I want to thank for all kinds of support of different kinds. So, thanks very much. There we go. I think here. Okay, thank you. There we go. Thank you very much, Peter. That was a super paper. And we're going to, um, at this point, move straight to our second speaker, um, which is Arjun Hoekstra from the University of Twente in the Netherlands. Arjun is a professor in water management at the University of Twente. He is the father of the water footprint, footprint concept and laid the foundations for the new field of water footprint assessment. As an interdisciplinary research uh, field addressing the relations between water management, consumption, and trade, Hoekstra has led a variety of interdisciplinary research projects and advised governments, civil society organizations, companies, and multilateral institutions. In 2008, he founded the Water Footprint Network. Hoekstra's scientific publications over a wide range of topics related to water management. His latest books include The Globalization of Water, The Water Footprint Assessment Manual, and The Water Footprint, A Modern Consumer Society. So Arjun, um, we look forward to hearing what you have to say in this presentation.
Thank you so much for inviting me to, uh, to stand here. I would like to, uh, uh, let me see how it works. The right one. Oh, the red one. The red. That one right there, the yeah. advanced the slide. You got to aim at that one. Oh, that's yeah. Okay. Good enough. There we go. Oh, that's better. Down. Page down. Page down. Yeah. Mm, this one is tough. Mm. Mm. We can uh, re load yep. this one. Do that. We'll just open it again. I think it, that'll work. Try this one. Okay. Hit that right button. All right. That button. Okay, so let me uh, start with showing some uh, s slides on my most recent uh, article, which appeared in uh, Science uh, earlier this month, where I put the water footprint in the context of the other footprint. Because it's not only our footprint that um, hits su the, the maximum sustainable uh, footprint level or exceeds that. But it's also, of course, our carbon footprint, which is well known, our ecological footprint, and our material footprint. So it's really a challenge to understand what is this maximum sustainable water footprint. But f of course, before that, to understand our footprint itself. So what this shows is how complex our modern world is. We have here a sketch of two geographical areas where in different places we have a footprint, and the sum of those uh, footprints of different processes, they will contribute to the final footprint of a product, as you can see over here. And different companies are involved, and it's an international, uh, international challenge because uh, those supply chains, they cross boundaries. If we talk about footprints, we talk about footprints of processes, which is the, the kind of the basic building block for any footprint uh, account. Then if we add the footprints of different processes, then we can calculate the water footprint of a product, which is uh, depending on the, the, water foot uh, the footprints during the process. And then finally, the footprint of a consumer or the whole uh, global consumption. Similarly, we can talk about the water footprint of, the, of, the, of a company uh, or of global production. In the end, the water footprint of global production is equal to the water footprint of global consumption, obviously. So let me give a summary of uh, the water footprint of uh, the average global consumer. Generally, if people think about uh, water use, people will think about the water use at home, but only 4% of the water footprint relates to water use at home. Yeah, is this better? Okay. I'm sorry, technology is failing. But this works, I guess. Uh, so 4% of our water footprint is, is at home. So 96% of our water footprint is kind of invisible for the uh, average consumer. It's the water footprint related to our consumer goods and mostly our food. So 92% of the water footprint is related to agriculture products. The average in the world is that 22% of the water footprint of people is not inside their own country, but even outside their own country. So this even um, worsens the, the invisibility of, of this water footprint. People have no idea. Even in water abundant countries, like my own country, people are strongly related to water scarcity elsewhere. In my country, 95% of the water footprint is outside the country, a large part related to uh, countries with water scarcity. So if we move then to uh, the U US, we see here 
how the water footprint of the average consumer in the US is composed. 4% related only to uh, the water use at home, 12% industrial water use, but then the rest is all related to agriculture products, and 40% of the water footprint related to meat products, which is an interesting result, because if you talk about water management, if you talk about um, ministries of water, water boards, and, and river basin plants, did you ever see the word meat or dairy in, in, such, a, in such a plan? So if you, if you take the consumer perspective, then we understand where water scarcity problems come from. They come from the, our need for commodities. Number one, meat. If we try to localize our water footprint, we can trace supply chains, and this is uh, a study we did for the US. So the colors, they show the amount of water use in different places in the world, uh, different uh, the amounts of water use related to products that are being consumed by US citizens. And you see that about 20% of the US water footprint lies within the US, 80% uh, lies within the US, but 20% lies outside the US. Interesting fact, the largest outside water footprint of US citizens lies in China, in the Yangtze River Basin. Did you know that? Is it? And if we, if we look at the, the, the commodities behind, we say, for instance, uh, we see maize in, in Mexico, we see uh, soybean in, uh, in Brazil, or for instance, cotton from India, Pakistan, and uh, many other places in the world. So if we zoom in, in on the water footprint within the US, we see that most of the water footprint is in, in, the, in the Midwest, in the Mississippi Basin. So 80% is still in the US. In many countries, uh, much larger percentages are outside the country. Like in Europe as a whole, 40% of the water footprint of Europe is outside Europe. Part of this water footprint, by the way, is in the US. A study for California showed that the top six water consumers are number one animal feed. Is this why we want to have water scarcity? Is this our choice? Does anybody know this? The answer is obviously no. People don't know that. Generally, the households are being uh, pointed at as being the ones that have to reduce water use. And of course, this is also important in California. But animal feed is the number one water user in California. But you not always see it because you don't see the animals. It's of course not the, the drinking water for the animals, it's the, the animal feed. And animal feed often looks very much alike human feed, food. So outside uh, the, the US you see many problems related to water as well. This is the RLC uh, uh, already mentioned, which is drying up uh, because of the use of the Amudaya and the CIDA two rivers not ending up in the RLC anymore because the water is being used to make uh, cotton. And all this cotton is exported from this region partly also to the US in a very indirect way because the cotton is being processed in other countries like Bangladesh and then ending up at uh, Western markets. So this is, uh, we managed to, uh, to dry up that lake in a very short time, uh, time span. So if we look at the water footprint concept, we look at the water use along supply chains. Uh, we look at uh, the spatial and the temporal dimension, obviously, because it very much uh, matters if we later on want to understand the impacts of the water use. So already mentioned the green and the blue components of water use, but the gray water footprint component shouldn't be uh, confused with gray water, as earlier mentioned. The gray water footprint is, is defined in a very specific way uh, relating to the, um, the volume of, of water that is being polluted. I will come back to that in a minute. I can go quick here because I think this is also clear. We have the green and the blue water resources from which we can tap. And the green water footprint shows, in fact, the volume of the green water flow that has been appropriated for human uh, purposes, whereas the blue uh, water footprint refers to the amount of blue water being appropriated for, uh, for human being. So both the blue and the green water footprint uh, are limited by the available green, respectively, blue water resources, obviously. 
So that's why we need to consider green and blue water footprint in the context of water availability within a catchment. The grey water footprint is defined like this. We have a process using water, and when abstracting the water, we abstract substance, which we can calculate by multiplying the water abstraction volume times the concentration of the substance in this, in this, uh, in this abstracted water. But we also have uh, substance output through our effluent, which we can know if we multiply the effluent volume with the uh, effluent uh, concentration, the chemical uh, concentration. So the load is substance output minus substance input, and we need to understand this load in the context of what we can call the critical load, which is the difference between the maximum allowable concentration in a river, uh, in a river or in a, in a lake or in groundwater body, and the natural concentration. So the difference between maximum and natural concentration times the renewal rate, for instance, the recharge of the groundwater or the river runoff gives the critical load uh, of the uh, ch a chemical in a fresh water body. Now, the grey water footprint is defined as the load divided by the critical load times the renewal rate. So, for instance, if the grey water footprint becomes equal to the river runoff, it simply means that the full river runoff has, has been used to assimilate pollution. If the grey water footprint goes beyond the, uh, the river runoff, then we have fully used the river and the, and the quality uh, of the river will not uh, meet the standards anymore. So let me give a few examples of supply chains. This is the example for meat. We see how complex it can be. This is an, an example for meat consumption in the UK, whereby, in fact, the, the meat comes from the Netherlands, but the feed comes from Brazil. And we have a sort of virtual water flow throughout this uh, supply chain, a water footprint in each part of, of the of the supply chain. If we look and compare different uh, commodities, in this case food commodities, we find uh, huge differences, and I think many of, of, of you have seen those kind of numbers, particularly, of course, the last one, the B15,000 uh, liter per kilogram. I get a lot of emails about this one, because particularly some farmers, they don't like the number. Um, but obviously these are global numbers, global average numbers, and this is very important to emphasize because the diversity is huge among countries, within countries, and it depends on the type of system. We have extensive industrial mixed systems, we have different efficiencies, so there are uh, numbers can often be two times, three times, four times bigger or smaller than the numbers shown here as global averages. And this is, of course, important because it gives us opportunity to become more efficient and to understand this variety and to understand how we can reduce water footprints of specific commodities is key. At the same time, however, we can also see that by simply shifting from one to another commodity, we can also save a lot of water. This is the water footprint of an um, of diet as we see it in industrialized countries based on FAO data on meat on, on consumption of both uh, ingredients from animal and vegetal, uh, vegetable origin. We consume about 3,400 kilocalorie uh, per day. Uh, we can see it here. Most of it is from vegetable origin. However, the water footprint of those ingredients from animal origin is five times larger than the water footprint of those ingredients from vegetable origin. So that makes a total water footprint of 3,600 liter per day that mostly is composed of the water footprint of the ingredients from animal origin. And if we then compare that to vegetarian diet without meat but still with dairy, whereby we replace the, the, uh, the meat by equivalent uh, vegetable uh, crop products, then we find that we can reduce the water footprint by about a factor uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. So just moving uh, consumption patterns can affect our water footprint hugely. So this is about water and food. And we talked about the nexus already earlier. If we talk about water energy, we also see a lot of, of, of strange um, kind of developments. 
because on the one hand, in the water sector, we see it becomes more and more energy intensive, while in the energy sector, we see this one becomes more and more water intensive. This is because of biomass, and this is because of shale gas, and I can give many other examples. So what we see is our understanding is very much fragmented. Our responsibilities in government are very much fragmented as well. So our, our advice to government and the, and the decisions made in government often try to so solve one problem in the energy sector, but then add to the other problem in the, in the water sector, or the other way around. So in the case of the water sector, we see that it is becoming more energy intensive because, for instance, desalination, pumping water from, from deeper or large scale into basin water transfers. So obviously, we need to understand how we can reduce our carbon and water footprint together rather than reducing the one and then increase the other one. This is an example of a study we did uh, on biomass, the water footprint of biomass, you see here on the, on the y-axis the water footprint in liter of water per liter of biofuel, either bioethanol or biodiesel. And then if at all we are going to replace fossil fuels by biofuels on a large scale, which is not a wise thing to do, then even if we do it, then we better make a right choice on what sort of crop. And then we see that sugar beet are much more efficient crop to grow with a smaller land and a smaller water footprint per unit of energy required than, for instance, rapeseed, which is often grown in many countries nowadays to get biodiesel. So we need to be informed by this kind of, of, of natural resource requirements of bioenergy. So car driving on bioethanol bio from sugar beet, which is if at all you, you do it, is the wisest choice, still takes about 20 to 300 liters of water per kilometer. So we need co coherent energy water strategies, obviously. Now what we see is that companies are increasingly interested in the water footprint concept. And the first company that was uh, interested was the Coca-Cola company. I remember vividly uh, Craig Koch, uh, responsible for water stewardship within the company coming to me in 2007, asking me for advice on uh, water st uh, stewardship within the, 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 the company, because they discovered that, uh, th first of all, they lost part of the market in India because people went into the street to demonstrate against the company, claiming that the company would over-extract groundwater and pollute it. So uh, the Coca-Cola company understood that they need to understand their water use, not only in their operations, but also in their supply chain. So they asked us to calculate the water footprint of a uh, half liter of, uh, of Coke. Uh, and we found this is uh, an example for the Netherlands, sugar beet from the Netherlands, uh, that 36 liters of water is necessary to just make that half liter bottle of Coke. And what was also very interesting is that we found that if you not produce this bottle in the Netherlands with sugar beet, but elsewhere in the world, for instance in Egypt with sugar cane, the number is five times bigger. So for a company like Coke, they now understand better that if you really so look at the source of ingredients and look at the impact on natural resources use, that it, it makes sense to, to look at that and to look whether you take sugar cane or sugar beet or high fructose maize uh, uh, corn syrup, um, and, and where precisely you take it and what, from what sort of farm, because it all matters if it comes to the final uh, water footprint of the, of the coke. Now what we see is that much more companies are starting to do water footprint assessment, particularly in the food and the beverage sector, but also in the pulp and the paper, in the technology, water supply technology sector, in the apparel sector, and also in and, um, kind of real industrial sector. So let me jump to the global picture of, of water use. This shows the blue in the middle, the green on top, and the gray water footprint spatially mapped. And what is, of course, interesting is to put this water footprint in the context of water availability and assimilation capacity. So this map shows the blue water scarcity defined as the blue water footprint at a certain spot divided by the blue water availability at the same spot, whereby blue water availability is simply total runoff minus environmental flow requirements. 
And then we see here the red areas, in fact, all the areas uh, with a value beyond one, beyond 100%, beyond these areas are unsustainable because the footprint exceeds the maximum sustainable water footprint, exceeds the blue water availability. And this is in many places on Earth, as you see. And all this is for free. I mean, water over exploitation is not, nobody pays a, a price or a direct price for that, at least not the consumers. The same thing we can do for the gray water footprint, divide the gray water footprint by the assimilation capacity, which is defined as the runoff. Again, here we see a lot of areas, and this is only the pollution related to nitrogen. A lot of areas where the assimilation capacity is exceeded. What we propose to, to countries is that they adopt this national water accounting framework, whereby they look at the water footprint of national consumption, defined as the sum of the internal water footprint for consumption plus the external water footprint of, of consumption. So the internal water footprint is wi the, the footprint within the country. It's the, the water footprint within the nation, insofar uh, meant to produce goods for domestic consumption. Then this external water footprint, of course, relates to the virtual water import into the country. But the water footprint within the nation is not only for internal water footprint, but also for water use for export. And the virtual water export is related to this one, plus this kind of re-export component. So this is what we uh, propose to national, um, uh, to nations to, to better understand how actually uh, they manage their water. W where does the water go? This is uh, always the focus is just on what is the water use in a place, that's all. Without looking really where does it go. And here you see where it goes. Um, you see by color the, the net virtual water import or export. So the, the, the green areas are the exporting nations. The US uses a lot of water for producing export commodities. We calculated that 30% of the water use in the US is related to export. And in fact, the, the US is the biggest water exporter in the world. And it's interesting because uh, Europe is the, one of the biggest uh, importers of the world and, and, and we don't pay for, for the problems that are left behind in the place of production. And we are happy for that in Europe. <laughs> so you see here the big exporters are USA, Australia, India and China. And these are not the countries that are well known for the excessive amounts of water availability, which is a bit different in South America, which is increasingly becoming the exporter. So we see in Europe the imports the wa of water-intensive commodities from the US declining and from the South America increasing. And again, trade is for, for free. Trade get goes at no cost and externalities are not included. And we, we try to promote that somehow even. What, what we see here is different countries with their water footprint per capita. On the, this axis we see the water footprint in cubic meter per year per capita. And then what is interesting is to see that here the USA is on the far right two times the global average. So I have no mercy with USA complaining about water scarcity problems. First of all, your water footprint is two times the global average. Second of all, 30% of your water footprint is for export. So why complaining? It's all your choice. <laughs> it's all about choices. But the choices are not being made very consciously. The choices are, are hidden because I guess nobody knows it. Who knows that the average American uses two times more water than the global average. Who knows that 30% of the water is for export? Who knows that 40% of the water use in the country is for animals and not for humans? This should be known in order to get political uh, discussion and debate about water allocation. You see that countries, Northern European countries like UK, Germany, also my own country, they are kind of 
the best examples of the, the Western world. You see the developing countries are all over the place because there are even some countries here which are not shown here, but these are countries not so much because they, if they consume so much, but they use water in a very inefficient way. So that can also be the case. I think we need global water footprint reduction targets. We need a certain kind of Kyoto protocol, but then not for carbon footprint reduction, but for water footprint reduction. We cannot see how we can increase the water footprint on Earth as a total, well, in fact, still populations are growing and the water footprints per capita are very inequitable distributed. So somehow we need to have international debate about this. A Kyoto Protocol for water. In 10 years time from now, we are talking about it. So water footprint reduction, what can we do? Now, it's very simple. Industries, they can strive towards zero water footprint. And not to confuse you, Zero water footprint does not mean zero water use, because as you remember, zero water footprint simply means recycling of the water, bring it back to the system, and clean. And this is possible, technology is available. So industries should move towards zero water footprint. For agriculture, this is uh, more difficult because you will always have evaporation from fields, uh, obviously. However, we need to use our green water resources more productively because, as already explained by Peter Weiskel, we have that focus on blue water resources, using blue and blue water more, uh, more efficiently. However, it's not about more and more efficient blue water use only. If we use our green water resources in rain-fed agriculture more efficiently, then we can produce our food in rain-fed ag agriculture in the places where there is enough water. And we don't even need to think about producing food in areas where no water does exist and where we then start over-exploiting the blue water resources. And zero grey water footprint is possible if we move towards organic or precision farming. Consumers can, of course, have a dual flush toilet or shower uh, five minutes instead of ten minutes, etc., etc. But the real thing is, of course, to look at your consumption pattern. What do you daily buy and what is the water footprint of this stuff? And of course, since you often don't know, ask for product transparency from business and ask government to regulate this so that we know that the water footprints of products are uh, not unreasonably high. Companies, they can use the water footprint standard as was, uh, for, uh, was uh, developed number of years ago by the Water Footprint Network in order to have shared terminology. Um, we need to have quantitative water footprint targets within business where benchmarking can be very instrumental. If we have benchmarks, and we are now developing benchmarks, we know the water footprint of one t-shirt does not need to be 3,000 liters per shirt as an average, but it can also be 1,000. But what technology do you need to get down to 1,000? So companies need to understand that and they need to get tools to work towards that. Of course, they can, first of all, reduce the water footprint in the operations, but for most companies, it's most important to reduce the water footprint within their supply chain, which is more challenging. For Coca-Cola company, for instance, as I already showed, 99% of their water footprint is in the supply chain. For instance, the sugar they buy, it's the largest sugar buyer in the world. And they can be very instrumental in moving farmers towards uh, technologies that reduce the water footprint of, of their crops. For government, it's key that they adopt this broader view on, on water accounting so that they better understand water, where the water goes. And of course, it's key to, to make these linkages between water, energy, agriculture, environmental and trade and foreign policy. Sometimes I often argue that we don't need a ministry of water. What we, what we really need is a ministry of energy that makes the right decisions and doesn't worsen the water problem. Or we need a, a proper ministry of agriculture with some wisdom about water so that the agriculture subsidies don't promote overuse of water. So we need to get water knowledge into other domains. And of course, also the other way around, 
energy knowledge within the water domain, etc. So what we need is water footprint caps per river basin. Of course, we, we, there is a maximum sustainable water footprint. We should not go beyond that per, per catchment. We simply should institutionalize that in law. And the government has a big task there because nowhere in the world does exist some sort of limit, a cap, to the water footprint within the catchment. It doesn't seem... So how can we be astonished about the fact that the water footprint in so many catchments goes beyond the sustainable level? simply because we never acknowledge that there is a maximum. So we need water footprint caps by river basin all over the world. We need water footprint benchmarks by products so that companies have something in their hands to strive towards. We need product transparency, maybe product labeling. Of course, the labels should be incorporated into existing broader labels on sustainability. Certification of industries, water footprint reporting, disclosure. All those kind of discussions are currently starting and global water footprint reduction targets a la Kyoto Protocol. This is one of my last ones. It summarizes a bit what is the challenge for different countries. Uh, the maximum sustainable water footprint, about 1,400 cubic meter per year per capita, goes down because of the population growth. We see it here, the red line. Sustain maximum sustainable water footprint will go down over time. China is still under that maximum currently but it is quickly growing, so China should go down. In the end, China should reduce its water footprint in the end of the century by about 20-25% compared to the level of today, rather than increasing. But the, the challenge for the US is much bigger, as you see. You see a sudden decline because of efficiency improvements, business as usual, but the real challenge is that the US reduces its water footprint over the coming century by 70%. So I would like you to refer to my latest book, The Water Footprint of a Modern Consumer Society, where I reiterate on all those discussions more elaborately. Um, and in the end, uh, my main message is why is water governance is particularly also smart spatial planning, informed agriculture, energy, tax trade, and foreign policies. I thank you very much.